Well, good morning. Welcome. How are we doing this morning? My name's Jeff, and I'm excited to share with you this morning. Let me tell you about this mug. So you guys are getting situated and seated. My dad gave me this mug, and my dad is a rocket scientist. Literally, he's an aerospace engineer, and uh, he's the smartest person I know. He's definitely smarter than your dad. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and in aerospace, they have, um, they have no room for error. Everything's measured down to the micrometer, and they test, and they retest, and they test again. And because if, if something fails in aerospace, then typically people die. And so they have a saying in the aerospace industry, and it says, failure is not an option. And they work hard at making sure every mission is successful, and they test, and they retest. And I remember my dad uh, going on business trips when we were growing up, and he'd come down here to Edwards or Vandenberg Air Force Base, and they would test these different turbo pumps that he had been designing. And at times, he'd even go back to Florida and get to uh, watch a launch of a shuttle or a Titan, something like that. And I remember one time specifically, my dad brought this mug home, and he brought one just like it for my brother, and he gave us these mugs, and he said, boys, I want you to remember that failure is not an option, not in your future and in your, in your life and your marriage and your relationships and in school. Failure is not an option. And what he was trying to say is, is that I want you to work hard. Don't give up. When it gets hard, don't throw in the towel because we need to be willing to do hard things. Roll up your sleeves, put some grit into it, work hard. And I learned that from my dad. It was really helpful. And so as I continued to process through and grow up and have this mug and this statement, failure's not an option, it got more challenging for me to reconcile with that because I failed. Because I did fail. And, and there was times when I failed in school or in relationships or as a son or as a husband, as a father, even in my relationship with God, there was times that I failed. And so that was difficult for me. It created a lot of pressure. I didn't understand, well, well failure's not an option, but I failed. And so what do I do with that? And I realized failure is not an option. It's not a choice. It's inevitable. Every single person fails. Every person in this room has probably failed at something at one point or another. We all get to points in our life when we just don't make it. Failure is not an option. It's inevitable. But failure is really important. Because without failure, there's no opportunity for redemption. And God is in the business of redemption. God wants to redeem our story. God wants to make something out of us. He wants to take a failure. He wants to take someone that's, that's blown it and create life and create fruit, transition from death to life, from darkness to light. Without failure, there's no opportunity for redemption, and that's what God has in store for you and me. And so the question becomes not are we going to fail, but what do we do when we fail? How do we move forward? How do we reconcile and so we get to look at a story this morning um, by a guy in the New Testament that I love. His name is Peter. And we, why do we love Peter so much? Because he's a failure, right? Because he just totally blew it. And so I love looking at Peter's life. And in fact, I've done this. I'm sure you have too. And looked back at the disciples' life and said, man, if I was there, if I had seen Jesus, if I had made eye contact with him and heard his words and watched him perform miracles, I think I'd have got it. These guys are sorry, <laughs> Man, Peter, seriously, you saw Jesus. You watched what he did, and you watched him perform miracles, and you still didn't get it? But we point back at those guys, and, and we're pretty quick. But be careful, because there's a couple things that led up to Peter's failure that we're going to look at this morning. There are some things that set him up not to succeed, but set him up to fail. And we can be so quick to do those same things. And so the first thing was that Peter was overconfident. And if we look back to the story in Matthew... Chapter 26, it says, Peter says to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. You ever said that? Jesus, I would never deny you. If someone walked in this room right now and put a gun to my head and said, deny your faith in Jesus Christ, I'll stand here before you right now and say, I sure hope that I'd never do that. And we've said that boldly. We watch the tragedies happen around the world, the martyrs for the Christian faith, and we go, I hope I can be like that. Jesus, I'm not going to deny you. I wouldn't. I'd die for you. And Peter says that in overconfidence and says, Jesus, I'll never deny you, even if I have to go to the grave. He's overconfident. Second thing is Peter was asleep. 
Literally, okay? So we're going to look at this story, and Jesus is going to take his disciples down through the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives. But we pull in a little bit of context from the other Gospels, and we see that Jesus takes his guys up, the Mount of, up toward the Mount of Olives, and he stops eight of them, and he says, you stay here, watch, keep watch right now. And he takes three more, Peter, James, and John, and he brings them a little further, and he says, you guys stay here and keep watch, and I'm going to go pray. And we know from Matthew chapter 26 that Jesus prays an agonizing prayer in that moment. And he says, Father, if, if you could take this cup from me, if there would be any other way, Lord, I don't want to have to go through this, but not my will, yours be done, and I'll do it if that's the only way. And Jesus was in such agony in that moment that he sweat droplets of blood. And he comes back to Peter, James, and John, and what are they doing? They're sleeping. Are you kidding me, you guys? This is the most critical moment in history. This is the most difficult part of my human life. And you're sleeping? All I asked you to do was keep watch. And so Jesus goes back again and he prays and he comes back a second and a third time. Every time they're asleep. Peter was asleep. He wasn't attentive. He wasn't being intentional. He wasn't focused. He wasn't alert. He wasn't on guard. Peter was asleep and he wasn't prayerful. Sets him up to, fo- to, to fail in that moment. Peter fell asleep. Um, a couple months ago, Cheryl and I got into a little disagreement. I'm sure that never happens in your home, and it never happens after 10 p.m., um, but <laughs> in my house it does. And so uh, we had a little, little argument, and um, you know, we processed through it together, and I realized what I'd done to hurt her, and um, you know, we talked through it together, and we get to that sort of stalling point in the conversation you know, where it's like, there's not, like, clear resolution here. Like, there's not really a clear direction of where we need to go to resolve this. And, um, and so we, we sort of stopped the conversation. And the first mistake I made, not the last mistake, the first mistake I made was to have this conversation in our bed. And so I did what a good husband and pastor would do to resolve conflict. I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not, that's not the worst part of it. I, didn't, I, did, I stayed asleep. I didn't wake up. And I, I woke up in the morning, and I'm a total morning person, so I get up, get going, you know, get my coffee, and, you know, get ready for the day, and I'm like, ah, oh, sweet, you know, his mercies are new every morning and stuff, and then my wife comes downstairs, and clearly something is not right in the Erky household, you know, and I go, well, what's the matter, is everything okay? You know, that was the second mistake, I asked, are you okay? And she said, are you, are you kidding me? Are you serious right now? Am I okay? That's what you're asking? You fell asleep! Oh. Man, I just remembered. That's right. Last night, um, someone came and asked. We were together, smiling together. And um, someone came and asked. um, They said, well, I hope you resolve that conflict. And Cheryl, with a smile, she looks and she says, it wasn't the only time he fell asleep. (laughs) Wow. Okay, so I'm a failure. I, I admit it right here, right now. Peter was asleep. He wasn't alert. He wasn't attentive. I wasn't alert. I wasn't attentive. I wasn't paying attention to what was going on. I wasn't investing enough energy into the conversation. Peter wasn't either. He set himself up to fail. So let's look at the scene here. John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew this place. For Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So these guys come upon Jesus. There's a group of Roman soldiers bringing weapons and swords and and lanterns. And they, they start to approach Jesus. He steps out in front to protect his guys. And he says, who is it that you're looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. And when he speaks these words, I am the great I am, I am he, boom, they fall to the ground. I think the disciples are, are awake now. Verse 17, or 7, excuse me. Therefore, he again asked, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I'm he, so if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke. Of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. 
Simon Peter then having a sword drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheep. Sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? So Peter, standing there thinking, I'm never going to deny Jesus. I got your back, Jesus. I'm in this, feeling his own strength by his sword, reaches out, grabs it, takes a swing, cuts Malchus's ear, and Jesus says, stop. And from Luke, we see Jesus reach up and touch Malchus's ear and heal it. This was a divine moment. Jesus was proving something. This is bigger than you, Peter. This is my story, not yours. Don't take things into your own hands. Mistake number one, Peter was relying on his own strength. He was relying on his sword. Stop, Peter. And by the way, do you think if I needed some help, I couldn't call on the name of my father and he would send thousands of angels to my aid? It says in Matthew chapter 26. And and Jesus says, Peter, this is for the reason I came and I am going to drink the cup that my father has given me. Remember, he just prayed that. Do you think for a moment I'm going to let you get in the way of that? Our greatest failure, living in our own strength, being prayerless and, and not being attentive, will not stop the power of God, will not stop the plan of salvation from succeeding. Even in your greatest failure, you can't blow that one. God's plan will win. He'll succeed. Let's continue. So they, they end up arresting Jesus. And they lead him back toward the city. And in verse 15 we pick up, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. So that was John. John knew the guy, so he gets Peter in. 17, the, then the slave girl who kept the door said, said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. In an instant, right on the tip of his tongue was that lie, defends himself. I'm not. Peter's first denial of Christ. He says to the girl, and we continue in 18, now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. Verse 25, I'm going to skip ahead a little here for sake of time. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. Lie number two, denial number two, lies love company. He's already said it once and now he's got to continue in this vein. I'm not. I said I wasn't. I'm not. 26, one of the slaves of the high priest being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. So Peter's caught in his sin because this guy was there. He was in the garden. He looks, and he sees Peter's face, and he goes, no, that was him. Looks down at his sword. There's blood on his sword. That's definitely him. That's the guy that cut my cousin's Malchus's ear. That's the guy. He was there, and Peter's trapped in his lie. He's stuck, and so he denies it again. Says, I'm not him. The book of Luke gives us a little more detail on this scene, and I love Luke because he's He's very meticulous, very methodical in his writing, and so he shares a little more information. I think it'd be helpful for us to see chapter 22, verse 59, this third denial. It says, after about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, certainly this man was with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered. So Peter checks over his back, looks up toward Jesus as he's denying Christ for the third time. Did he hear what I said? Did he see me? And Jesus looks down, makes eye contact with him. And the pain and the failure and the betrayal that was in Jesus' face destroyed Peter. His stomach dropped. The thing that I said I would never do. We're going to leave Peter here for a minute. We're going to come back because I want you to see how he responds to this failure. It's really important. There's a great lesson here. But I want to continue in the text and see this interaction that Jesus has with Pilate. So continue with me in verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered and said, if this man were not an evildoer, we wouldn't have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. 
to fulfill the word of which Jesus spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. So here's what happens. The high priest Caiaphas takes Jesus to the house of Pilate. Why? Because they were trying to condemn Jesus, and they didn't do a very good job, but ultimately they knew they wanted to crucify him. They wanted to put him to death, and they weren't allowed to do it. But Pilate was. Why? Because Pilate was the Roman authority over Israel during this time. He wasn't a Jew. So they come up to his house. They're not allowed to go in the door because they're Jews, and it would be entering the home of a Gentile, which would mark them unclean or defile them, and they wouldn't be able to participate in Passover. Just as a side note, this is really important because Caiaphas, the high priest, has to remain clean to go according to the Hebrew law and the sacrifice that was about to take place, the Passover sacrifice, which in this particular year would have been Jesus. Jesus was going to be the Passover sacrifice once and for all to die for the sins of man and to keep in vain with Hebrew law. They had to remain clean. This was methodical. So they stop right outside the door of the praetorium, which is Pilate's house where he resides, They don't go in. Pilate comes out. They have this brief conversation. Pilate goes back inside and summons Jesus. Let's see verse 33. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Well, are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? And Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Pilate, this is bigger than you. You're missing the big picture. If I was after a kingdom, if I was after a crown, don't you think I'd have people out there swinging swords and fighting for me? My kingdom is of a whole different sphere. It's part of eternity. It's not about today. It's not about right now. Don't miss that. And Pilate, in his own home, sitting face to face, with the Messiah, Jesus Christ, engaging in a conversation with him, hearing from him about his kingdom has the opportunity now to respond to truth, to engage, to, to ask further question. Let's see what he does. Verse 37, therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth Here's my voice. Jesus says, you're right. The Christmas story is that Jesus, a baby, a humble man, came to this earth not as a conquering king, but as a baby, a humble man, so that he could die once and for all for the sins of man because he says, my kingdom is so much bigger than this. It's all about eternity. It's not about right now. It's not about Israel. It's not about the Jewish leaders. My kingdom is bigger than that. And I came for this reason, and the reason was to bring truth. And he says earlier, the truth will set you free. And so, Pilate, if you were to embrace truth, if you were to be interested in the truth, then you'll have life. Because you'd hear my voice if you're of the truth. Pilate's response, verse 38, throws up his hand and says, what is truth? He walks out. How are we going to respond to the truth? Because failure is inevitable. We're going to fail. And uh, by the way, Pilate's biggest failure in this moment, if you were to read in Matthew, is his wife actually told him not to not to entertain the idea of trying Jesus. She said, stay away from that man, that righteous man, because I had a bad dream and he's going to torment us. So Pilate's failure in this moment was that he didn't listen to his wife. But in our greatest failure, the inevitable failure, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to the truth? Will we be like our culture and our world that says, what is truth? What does it even matter? I've failed so many times you don't even know. What is truth? What's ab- There's no such thing as absolute truth. It's whatever I feel like. Or will we respond like Peter did? Let's see what Peter does. This is my favorite part. Again, looking back to Luke chapter 22. So remember, Peter looks over his shoulder, sees Jesus, makes eye contact, and he he immediately realizes what he's done. The rooster crows, standing in his betrayal, standing in his failure in that moment. What does he do? Verse 62, and he went out and wept bitterly. He went outside the city gates and he threw his face in his hands and he fell to the ground and he wept bitterly. He was broken over his sin, broken for his failure. When's the last time you wept bitterly over your sin? I thought about that this week as we were preparing for the message and I thought, man, 
I don't, I don't remember very many times of being so broken over my sin that I wept bitterly. Maybe, you know, maybe kind of growing up in high school, formative years, and you make some mistakes, and you really realize the power and the weight of your sin, and you confess it to God, and you weep over your sin. But, you know, if I'm honest, and if you're honest with me, if we, if we sat down together and maybe evaluated where we were at in our spiritual journey, I think a lot of times we don't think our sin's that bad. We go, well, yeah, but it's just, it's just a lie. You know I mean? It's no big, didn't hurt anybody. It was just a, a prideful thought or a comment. That, I mean, what, what does that matter? That our sin is, is sort of on this surfacey level, and we think, well, those people have deep sin. They need to confess their sin, and, and certainly that group over there, they got to be broken for their sin. But me, I don't really have that big of a you know, sin problem. But it says in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That sin, no matter how small or how large, separates us from God. And in Romans chapter 3 later, it says that there is no one righteous. No, not one. And I don't care how small you think your sin is, it's separating you from God. Have you been broken by it? Have you went outside the city and wept? I think we need to do that, church. I think we need to let our sin break us for a moment. But here's the amazing thing, is Peter doesn't stay outside weeping. He doesn't stay in his misery. He doesn't wallow or feel sorry for himself. What does Peter do? The next time we see Peter after this failure, John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, and while it was still dark... And saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Where was Peter? He was with John. Peter was with John. At some point between Friday night and Sunday morning, Peter went and found John or else John found him. And he's sitting down with John and I bet you in 24, 30 hour period, he probably spent some time confessing his sin. I bet you Peter said, John, I I blew it. And John, strategically, being the one whom Jesus loved, a disciple who understood what love was, was able to speak truth to Peter in that moment. And I bet you that he said, Peter, remember what Jesus said, that we're not going to be fishermen, we're going to be fishers of men. And remember when he called you the rock? And remember when he promised that the church is going to be built on your shoulders? Do you remember that, Peter? Because Jesus has a plan for you, and he wants you to hear and see and believe truth. Don't stay in your sin. Don't stay outside the city crying. And I think John spoke truth to Peter in that moment, don't you think? And then what they do, he took him to Jesus. Actually raced him, Peter lost. They raced to Jesus because Mary says, There's, the tomb is gone. We don't know where Jesus is. And so they ran. They ran toward Jesus together. John met Peter in his failure. And together they went to Jesus. Peter came back to Jesus. That's the second point. We need to come to Jesus. You can't stay in our failure. You can't stay wallowing in your sin. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Let it break you, Yes. Get up, go find John, go back to Jesus. And finally, Peter embraced truth. He believed the words that Jesus had spoken to him. He believed the truth that John communicated to him. He probably recited some of it, I think, and and we get to see this interaction later. We'll see it in a few weeks between Jesus and and Peter, where, where Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And they have this conversation take place and Peter says yes I love you and there's a forgiveness tone in that conversation where Peter's restored and he says then go feed my sheep because Peter believed what Jesus said was true and we get to see him in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 3 he says repent and return for a time of refreshing may come and in that moment he spoke to 3,000 people and many were added to their number that day people were saved and they got baptized because Peter believed that he was who Jesus says he was and he went forward and the church was born a movement was started and it went from there to Antioch and it went to Samaria and Cyprus and Galatia and Lycia and Greece and eventually to Rome and we're here today at Tascadero Bible Church because Peter believed that he was who Jesus said he was and he wouldn't stay in his failure he didn't stay outside the city he didn't stay wallowing in his own sin he got up and he went and found John and he went to Jesus and he embraced the truth and he said on this rock I will build my church I remember that Jesus said that and so I'm going to be obedient to what God has called me to do and I'm going to communicate truth and he knew that Romans chapter 8 
was true. And it says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor any nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that I could fail and I could blow it and I could deny Christ even but there's nothing that will separate me from the love of Jesus Peter knew it and he believed it we need to embrace that truth this morning friends that if we trust Jesus and the power of his blood to redeem the most broken failing moments of our life, then we can use, be used by God. What's stopping you right now from embracing truth? There might be a mountain that you feel like is so big, even God couldn't move it. You might have a broken relationship that you think even God couldn't restore it. You might be believing a lie that you're good enough on your own. But let me just remind you that you're not good enough on your own and Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, if you embrace that truth, is eternal life. Don't believe the lie that you're not good enough, that your failure is too large for God to reconcile. Don't believe the lie that you're good enough or that your marriage can be healed or restored apart from the blood of Jesus. Don't believe the lie that you'll succeed in your career or your business apart from the love of God. And don't believe the lie that you're ruined by your failure. Because failure is inevitable. Failure is not an option, it's a guarantee. You're gonna fail. But what are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna respond? Are you gonna allow God to work in that moment? In that, uh, we're gonna take communion this morning. And um, as, the, as the men prepare to pass around the elements, I just want to have you consider something for a moment this morning. Where are you at in Peter's story? Where does it, where does it strike you? Are, you? are you sitting here this morning having not been broken by your sin? Have you allowed the failure that you experienced to break you in such a way that you went outside the city and wept? When have, when have you wept over your sin? Consider that for a moment this morning. And, and you may need to weep. You may need to stop and say, you know what, my sin, even though I may see it small or the society I live in sees it small, my culture, my church says it's not that big of a deal, didn't hurt anybody, that it separates you from God and it ought to cause you to weep. Maybe you've been weeping for years. Maybe your failure is so large that, that you haven't overcome it yet. Maybe you're still outside the city with your face in your hands. This morning, I just want to just want to remind you that there's redemption in our failure. You need to get up, and you need to go find John. Get up and go find John, and have him take you to Jesus, because there's redemption in your failure. Don't stay outside the city. Don't stay weeping. The morning is coming. Get up and go find Jesus. And there's a third group in this room this morning. And sometimes we've embraced Christ. We've ran to Jesus. We've wept over our sin. But we need to listen and hear truth because we hear lies from every single source in our life, from the media, from our family sometimes, from our friends, from everything we read on the news or see on TV, from music and movies. We believe lies that either we are good enough apart from God or that there will be nothing made successful in my life. You might need to claim truth for your life this morning. You might need to look back at the words Asama says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made that before the creation of the world, God ordained you and that he knit you together in your mother's womb, that you were created and called for a purpose and that God works together all things for the good that, of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. You might need to embrace truth this morning. And so we're gonna go ahead and pass communion this morning and just consider where do you land in that story? Where are you? And, and seek God. And you may need to pray that prayer in Psalm 139 that says, God, would you search me and see if there be any offensive way in me? Do I need to be weeping or broken over my sin? We're gonna go ahead and sing a song. And as these guys sing and the, the plates pass, just consider for a moment. You don't need to sing, but just let these words resonate in your heart.
winds fall and the tempest roars, you are with me. When creation folds, still my soul will soar. Spirit revived in your story. I'll look to the cross as my failure is lost in the light of your glorious grace. So let the ruins come alive in the beauty of your name, rising up from the ashes. Forever you reign, and my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will love you forever, and forever I'll sing. When the world caves in, still my hope will So Jesus brought together his disciples the night before and he gathered them in a room and he gave them a little pep talk and he said, it's going to get hard. This isn't going to be easy. And he knew for those guys that they were going to face persecution and some of them death and that it was going to be painful. And so what he did is, is he asked them to remember when those days seem really hard, when your failure is inevitable, when it's right before you, I want you to remember what I did for you on the cross because that's what changes everything. And so he took the bread and he said, remember you guys, this is my body that I broke for you so that you could have success in the midst of your failure. And Jesus' blood was spilt and his body was broken for us and he says, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, and these guys knew exactly what he talked about when he meant his blood was spilled. He understood the sacrificial system. And I think in hindsight, they looked back and realized that Jesus was the Lamb of God who died once and for all for all their sin. And he said, remember this. Remember that my blood was poured out as a sacrifice so that it's finished. It's done. There's no more sin in this world if you accept the blood that has washed you clean. And so he passed it around and said, drink this and remember what I did for you. And God, we stand before you this morning as a bunch of failures, just like Peter. And we are so desperate, Lord, for your words of truth to speak into our hearts and remind us, Lord, that there's no failure too great. God, that there's nothing you couldn't redeem and that what you did on the cross to break your body and pour out your blood for us was a payment for sin once and for all, God. And we stand redeemed. And so, Lord, even as we respond this morning, as we have offering and we sing songs and we, we fellowship together as a church, Lord, would all these things point to you and what you've done for us on the cross? And I just pray, Lord, that ABC Church, Atascadero Bible Church would be about the resurrection of our lives 
as you conquered sin once and for all. Thank you, Father. We love you and we praise you. In your name I pray, amen. So I'll walk, so I'll walk through the fire Let my head lifts it high Let my spirit revive your story I'll look to the cross as my faith If, if you've heard the story and seen the narrative of Peter and you haven't necessarily identified with him, that's okay. If, if you've been through a process and a lot of us on a spiritual journey have gone through waves and we've gone through failures and successes and redemption and all these things and maybe this morning you're sitting here going, you know what, I don't really identify right now with that. I have in the past. But, but I'm on a good track with God. We're moving and, and I'm, I'm in a place where I'm really trusting in him and I'm hearing truth. Let me just encourage you this morning. Could you be John for somebody? Could you be somebody's John? Could you go find them outside the city gates and put your arm around them and say, this is what's true about you. Because at ABC we believe in life transformation and it happens only by God's word. It only happens by communicating truth and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we do it every weekend here at church and we do it in our community groups and we do it at High Life and in kids ministry and all those places. But you know where life transformation really happens? One on one. Where, where you're able to communicate truth to somebody who's in need of it. Could you be John for somebody this week? Look around your community, look around your workplace, your school, your neighborhood, and look in who's, who's needing truth. And so this week, I just want to encourage you, let's go. Let's go be the church. Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful week.